This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome. Episode 220 for November 20, 2016. Our Die November story this week is Raptor Boy by Elise Fourier Edie, a Cast of Wonders original. A special thank you to our audio producer, Jeremy Carter, for the excellent photo in this week's episode artwork. Check out his Etsy shop, On the Edge Photos, which we'll link for you in the show notes. Elise Fourier Edie is an author and playwright based in Los Angeles. Her speculative fiction has been published in anthologies and magazines, and her plays have been performed throughout the U.S. and Canada. Recent works include a short story, Lucy in the Sky, about a little girl at war with the Fairy Queen, published this summer in The Enchanted Conversation, and forthcoming Backwater Saints, about rock bands and necromancers in the Florida Everglades, due out in Disturbed Digest in December. Her play, The Pink Unicorn, about a Christian widow grappling with her teenaged daughter's announcement that she is genderqueer, will be playing in Pittsburgh in January 2017 at Off the Wall. Our narrator for today's episode is Alex Hofflick. He is co-editor of Pseudopod, the longest-running weekly short horror fiction podcast. He is currently rereading the Three Investigator series, which was one of his entry points into the horror genre. He recommends hunting down a copy of those or Roger Zelazny's A Night in the Lonesome October to help your journey. And now, we've a tale to tell. Raptor Boy by Elise Fourier Edie I'm running between cornfields on a dark country road. A rifle slung on my back pounds my spine. The moon rises ahead, gigantic and golden. I think of werewolves, of holes in the sky. I picture my spine unzipping and a giant lizard crawling out of my skin. My foot snags on a tuft of grass. I stagger and catch myself before my chin hits the ground. Behind me, in town, my older brother Arnie rallies with a troop of redneck warriors. They are frenzied on drugs, eager to maim. Their loud laughter circles the lone street lamps shining above Happy Dax Trailer Park. Earlier on, Happy Dak said, The Saeed family needs to be taught a lesson. You gotta show them camel jockeys who's boss in McCall. He promised untold rewards for every drop of blood spilled, and when Sylvie fired up the sparkle pipe and Happy Dak started chanting his pagan charms, I grabbed my gun and split. I don't even know what I'm gonna do with the rifle. I can't imagine shooting Arnie, or even any of his hyenic friends. But Happy Dak said the words fire, rape, and blood. So I'm running my feeble feet through the cornfields, a tottering raptor boy, trying to be a hero. Asim Saeed was once my friend. We swapped comic books, studied constellations. Summers we camped in fallow fields with Claire Dawn Yellow, tracking the Perseid meteor shower. I learned the words saponification, salat, and nebulae at his home. He learned the words adamantium, velociraptor, and etridactyl from me. We haven't spoken for more than a year, but the thought of an attacker tearing down his door of a seam's cheekbones shattering under the iron hide jaws makes my own face cringe with sympathy. A seam's house will crackle in flames, the goats will be slaughtered, his family will be scourged. I've eaten supper at his table. His baby sister Aisha used to tug on my fingers. I've worked for a seam's mom helping her make soap in a shed by the house. Her hand used to warm my shoulder. You're a good boy, tiger, she would tell me. I'm glad a seam has you for a friend. Now I whisper, stay with me, stay with me, as I lurch down the road. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't think it's a seam or his mom. At a crossroads, I turn and head towards Claire Dawn's house. A sprinkler hisses in a field and a patch of cooler air wafts over my skin. Through a copse of fir trees, a lighted window glimmers. I pray Claire Dawn will be awake. I won't make it to a seam's farm in time without her. From Claire Dawn, I learned these words. Scaphism pillory, and camshaft. She taught them to me in the summer before we turned 14. She'd been rebuilding her first car engine, a wrecked Toyota her dad bought at an auction. She used to regale me with graphic descriptions from books with titles like A History of Torture and The Big Book of Pain. She made a study of human cruelty, she said, so she'd never be surprised if someone poisoned her horse or stole her land. I listened to Claire Dawn's stories all summer while I handed her tools. My ancestors used to cut off the fingers of their enemies, then they'd make them eat them one by one. You should tell people that's what happened to you, Tiger. 
Pass the ratchet driver, would you? I held my hands out. The finger bones fused to make three misshapen digits like claws. It's called cleft hand. The condition warped my toes, too. I keep my feet safely wrapped in orthopedic shoes, but my hands are always visible. They gross out everyone in town. I said, I didn't need my fingers cleared on. I was born this way. But you could tell people. Make you seem like a real badass. I'm already a badass. I'm Velociraptor Boy. I crouched and cocked my head, making a little predatory noise with a clicking in my throat. I perfected this sound while watching dinosaur movies over and over. Half the little kids in McCall were firmly convinced I was part raptor. That was fine. Fobbed off teasing pretty well. That's just your freak show, Handel cleared on, said. Would you really kill somebody, Tiger? Torture them? Eat them? No way, I'm a force for goodness. My summer reading had been full of graphic novels with all morally upright anti-heroes. I asked her, would you? She paused in her work, wiping a sweaty lock of hair from her cheek and leaving a streak of grease behind. I might kill someone, if I was mad enough, or if they were taking my home. Well, I'd negotiate. Hmm. Not everything's negotiable, Tiger. Asim found Claire Dawn's obsession with suffering and torment a little disturbing, too. But when she got that Toyota running, she'd haul us to Outlaw Lake whenever we asked. He's in dirt roads and private pastures, so she wouldn't get pulled over for driving without a license. We traded graphic novels and played complex, day-long board games with tiny plastic pieces. The sheriff is called Sparkle, a county scourge. The Ace of True Brotherhood call it awesome. Under Happy Dak's wizardry, I know it's both. And it's as dangerous and as awful as building a bonfire in your living room. Out loud, I say to Claire Dawn, You don't have to come, I just need your car. A smile shifts on one side of her mouth. Think I'd let you drive my ride, Raptor boy? With that, she turns and heads to the old corn crib where she keeps her vehicles. I follow, my legs shaky from relief. Claire Dawn's bought, rebuilt, and sold several cars since that little Toyota back in 8th grade. She's got a bank account all fat with cash and plans to apply early admission to Harvard. She'll get in, too. I have no such account in my name. Any hope of attending college was cut off by a series of unexpected events. The solid job my father lost two years before. The subsequent cancer treatments my mother needed with no insurance to pay for him. The st- I sneak in the yard. The light is on and cleared on second floor window, so I kneel and grab a handful of gravel. Three small tosses on a lower pane, a pause, and then two more. A minute later, out pops Claire Dawn's head. I wave my claw. She hesitates, then waves back. When she disappears from the window a second later, I know she's on her way down. I lean up against a fir tree while my heartbeat slows. A minute later, she flits from the house. What are you doing here, Tiger? Her whisper sounds angry and scared. Happy Dax sending Arnie and them to Seam's farm tonight. And you're not going? I don't bother to defend myself. I just say, it's for some Ace of True ritual, and yeah, yeah, I get it. They're on Sparkle. I swallow reflexively at the memory of warm blood clots sliding in gobs down my throat. So who knows what they'll do once they get there? Claire Don nods. She doesn't know about Ace of True magic or holes in the sky, but she knows about drugs and Sparkle. It's a lot like meth, only with creepier side effects. One guy ate off some girl's face while he was on the stuff. Another dude dumped lie on a baby. The sheriff is called Sparkle, a county scourge. The Ace of True Brotherhood call it awesome. Under Happy Dak's wizardry, I know it's both. And it's as dangerous and as awful as building a bonfire in your living room. Out loud, I say to Claire Dawn, You don't have to come, I just need your car. A smile shifts on one side of her mouth. Think I'd let you drive my ride, Raptor boy? With that, she turns and heads to the old corn crib where she keeps her vehicles. I follow, my legs shaky from relief. Claire Dawn's bought, rebuilt, and sold several cars since that little Toyota back in 8th grade. She's got a bank account all fat with cash and plans to apply early admission to Harvard. She'll get in, too. I have no such account in my name. Any hope of attending college was cut off by a series of unexpected events. The solid job my father lost two years before. The subsequent cancer treatments my mother needed with no insurance to pay for him. The stalled progress of the Canatrack pipeline. The last economic hope of my hometown. 
Now Dad flogs the graveyard shift for minimum wage at a pet food factory two hours away. My mother is dead with nothing but a pile of unpayable bills left behind. Arnie and I don't have jobs. No one in town does. In fact, Claire Dons and Asim's families are about the only two still making a decent living in McCall. And this is what sticks in Happy Dak's craw. The richest families in town are headed by an Ojibwe Indian and a Muslim widow. Norwegians and Germans built this place, he said time and again. An ace of true brotherhood must restore it to its rightful heritage. I used to think Happy Dak's speeches were inspiring. But I also used to think his magic was like aromatherapy candles and rabbit feet, essentially harmless, rooted in the power of suggestion. The last thing I expected to happen was something real. I cleared Dawn's corn crib, I smell engine oil. She unlocks a black jeep, shiny as a beetle. I climb inside. The leather seats are smooth, oiled to the softness of rose petals. Do you have a plan, she asks, as the engine grinds and fires. I can tell you about Happy Dax. She nods and shifts the jeep into gear, easing it down the dirt road. Happy Dak laid it out in the dust by his pickup truck. First, Arnie and his friends will divert McCall's three-person police force by starting a fire in an abandoned business park next to the highway. At the same time, another group will trip the alarms of three different pivot irrigation systems, thus tying up available county forces as well. When the beleaguered dispatchers finally get a call about malicious mischief on Mrs. Saeed's farm, Police will be far too busy to respond. Arnie and his friends will have enough time to slaughter the goats, hunt down Asim's family, destroy Mrs. Saeed's self-respect, and get away, free and clear. I don't tell Claire Dawn there will be no incriminating evidence left behind. That all law enforcement will ever find are the scales and talons of impossible beasts. That the case will go to fish and wildlife and then nowhere at all. I just say... I don't think we can stop Happy Dak's crew from messing up the farm, but we can get Asim's family away before the posse shows up. And then you'll turn your brother in, right? Everything stops for a second. I think, it won't really be Arnie. It will be his hammer form. But Claire Dawn misunderstands my hesitation. Her mouth hardens as the jeep judders over a cattle grid. Didn't you used to be a force for good, Tiger? I say, I thought I was. When Happy Dak and his daughter Sylvie first moved to McCall, my mother had only just died. Dad sat motionless at the kitchen table nights, not even eating or watching TV. Arnie still had a job driving truck for the pipeline and was away a lot. Asim was struggling with AP physics, his focus firmly fixed on MIT's astronomy program. So I was alone all that spring, limping my way through the halls at school. And right then, when I was feeling low as worms, Sylvie Magnuson slid up to me. I was fumbling with my books by my locker. She swirled her silver hair on one fingertip. She purred. Hey, Tiger, is that really your name? Hey, Tiger, do you have one in your tank? My body vibrated like a tuning fork. I followed her home. We talked on her back porch. She touched my hands. She asked if having them made me feel angry. Then she asked if having them made me feel special. I think you're special, she said. The load of sorrow in me floated off on honeysuckle-scented air. I never thought I'd get to touch a girl like Sylvie, but she let me, and she was soft as sorrow. Now Claire Dawn hunches over the wheel as we crest a hill. Wind ruffles moon-tinged grass. She breaks. We stare down at a seams farm, dark and peaceful below. It looks safe and snug, like always. There's a tree in front where a seam and I put up a tire swing for Aisha a few years ago. I almost toppled twenty feet trying to sling the rope over a branch. Asim and I laughed about it afterwards and told the story over and over. Remember the tire swing, how you almost fell? I screamed like a girl. You did, man. It was awesome. Claire Dawn's voice interrupts my thoughts. I'll keep watch up here. If I see Arnie and them coming, I'll text you. Once we get the Saeeds away, I'm calling the police. No. Yes, she turns to me. Tiger, they can't get away with this. Except they will. I can't explain. It'll just sound crazy and then she might drive off. So I grab my gun, slide out of the car, and head down the hill, leaving Claire Dawn behind me in the dark. Not long ago, I looked up Happy Dak online. I'd never thought to do it before. His handsome, charismatic face came up. Same great crew cut, same crystalline eyes. Dag Magnuson, a.k.a. Happy Dak, had spent time in jail for assaulting Mexican farm workers in eastern Washington. 
He had also written some publicly posted treatises about Nordic paganism and Asa True Magic. In a piece about berserkers, I found reference to the I.G. Einhammer Viking shapeshifters. Happy Dak wrote nothing about his series, how strong psychotropics could be coupled with ritual, could literally transform a willing warrior into a beast. But I felt that zipper in the back of my spine tingling. I saw the hole in the sky open up, and I couldn't get away from my computer screen fast enough. It was Sylvie who taught me the words Teutonic, Metagenetics, and Lycanthropy. Her stories of Viking shapeshifters sounded like a fairy tale at first. When she said her dad was a wizard, I imagined some eccentric hobby like tarot or meditation. When she touched feather light lips to my earlobe and suggested Happy Dak could make me stronger, I just nodded and thought, What could it hurt? Sure, I'll smoke those drugs, Sylvie. Yeah, I'll invite my brother and his friends over, too. You want me to pray to pagan gods? I'll do that. Just, just keep touching me. Just keep making my deformed body feel good. Once Canatrek went belly up, and Arnie and his many friends lost their jobs, Happy Dak had us all where he wanted. He'd amassed a little army of country boys, former high school football players, and me. He could start darkening the land with his hate crimes again. Only this time, he'd found a way to never get caught. I'm limping by the time I make it to a seams house. The risen moon spangles his front yard with silver. I pass Aisha's feast on your blood with no remorse. A seam won't believe a thing I say. I gave his trust up a year ago. The first time Sylvie called him a camel jockey and I just laughed. He has pulled his crossbow from the hall closet. I remember when he bought it, a Barnett Raptor. We thought that was funny how his bow had my nickname. At least let me take Aisha and your mom. At least let them go with Claire Dawn and me. It seems black eyes shimmer as he nods. I take a deep breath and nod back. Mrs. Saeed starts protesting while Aisha wraps her arms around me. She's warm and skinny as a cattail. I'm hugging her back when my phone buzzes. It's Claire Dawn letting me know she's seen the posse. They're only minutes away. I heft Aisha on one hip and say, I'll let the goats go on my way out. While Mrs. Saeed implores a seam to come with us, I slip out the back door, Aisha still clinging to me like a monkey. The goats are housed in a good-sized pen. Aisha calls each one by the names, the syllables soft in her mouth. Kalila, Rabab, Kamar. The latch is complicated and my claw is clumsy, but finally the gate swings open. Most of the goats, moved by curiosity or mischief, will drift from the pen. Once the monsters arrive, they will run. Most can be recovered later. It's the best I can do. I hitch Aisha tight against me and head back towards the front of the house. As I round the corner, Mrs. Saeed joins us. She is alone and we exchange a helpless look. We both know how stubborn a seam can be. She grabs my elbow so I can lead her in the dark. The mob's headlamps, all in a row beyond the field, snake their way closer. Behind us, the house goes suddenly black. I picture a seam crouching alone by the living room window, his crossbow armed and ready. I remember crouching by the same window with him years ago, trying out a new telescope, marveling as he pointed it at Arcturus and Mars. When exactly did I let him go? I don't know, and that's the worst part. Sylvie didn't like him. She said he was standoffish and proud that his people were naturally violent, that I could not trust someone with an Arab name. And I made no attempt to defend him. I didn't explain the superhero code he and I had written in sixth grade, how Asim had stood by my side when we buried my mother, how he had called me first when he won the National Merit Scholarship, that we had begun to design a computer game about Lysithia and Jupiter. Instead, I just let Sylvie say horrible things and I laughed and joined her. The truth is, it felt good, sitting with a pretty girl, our warm bodies pressed together, her smoky voice in my ear, even if we were just hating people. Hate feels good as long as you don't do it alone. That's the biggest secret buried in the pages of Claire Dawn's torture books. Not that people are awful to one another, everyone knows that, but no one explains how being awful is so much fun. We're here, Miss Said says, startling me. We're right here, Tiger. I realize I started whispering again as we plod up the hill. I'm chanting, stay with me, stay with me. And Mrs. Saeed thinks I'm talking to her. I'm so sorry. 
I don't know if I'm apologizing for the past year or for what's happening tonight. In a way, it's the same thing. Mrs. Saeed says, This is not your fault, Tiger. You would never do such a thing to us. I think of Sylvie giggling and calling her a camel humper. I open my mouth to tell Mrs. Saeed, I already did. But right then I hear footsteps and turn, startled. It's Claire Dawn running down the hill. She grabs me by the forearm and says, Where's the seam? He wouldn't come. He's in the house with his crossbow. She looks down the slope. The headlights are turning up the driveway. He called the cops. Did you? I ask. Yeah, but you were right. They might be a while, and he's all alone down there. Mrs. Saeed says, What can we do? Claire Dawn and I look at one another. She says, Arnie's your brother. I get why you can't fight him. So you drive these guys to my dad's farm, and I'll go down and help Asim. No, they'll kill you, Claire Dawn. I mean it. I know what people do. She doesn't know anything. But I won't stand by. I can be a witness, Tiger. I can film this. I'll put it on the internet. No one will ever say it didn't happen and everyone will know who did it. She holds up her phone like it's a lightsaber. I want to say, Claire Dawn, they'll think your video's a joke even if you live to tell the tale. But out loud, I tell her, it's dark. You won't even be able to see who's down there. I have to try. Don't you see? It's a seam's place tonight. It'll be my dad's farm tomorrow. Every brown-skinned person in McCall's going to be a target, right? Before I can say anything, she presses the jeep keys in my hand and runs down the hill, warrior brave. Below me, trucks spin into the yard, horns honking. The Brotherhood whacks bats and sticks on the sides of the doors. The hullabaloo sounds like it comes straight from hell, and Arnie's strong voice bellows above the others. He still sounds human, but he won't for much longer. Claire Dawn becomes a spot in the darkness, swallowed by shadows. I'm sure she already has her phone held up, recording everything for posterity. You make a million choices every day. Every one of them matters. Quickly, before I can think about it, I press Aisha into Mrs. Saeed's arms. They both make little sounds of surprise. There's a glimpse of dark eyes, trusting. Then I drop the keys in Mrs. Saeed's hand. I head down the hill after Claire Dawn at top speed. I yell as loud as I can. I try not to think about how much it will hurt when they sink their teeth into me. Instead, I remember how it was when I transformed. How Happy Dak had the Brotherhood sit in a circle. I was ringed by crew cuts, blue jeans, big grins. Sparkle smoke curled down my throat as I passed a pipe, and Happy Dak chanted. I told myself, it was just a ritual, like baptism. It wouldn't change me any more than my twisted hands could be changed. Some things are unchangeable, I thought. Reality, for instance. Human nature. Bones. Someone coughed. Across from me, Arnie's green eyes gleamed. Nearby, his behemoth friend Lars Strickland laughed and pointed. The pipe had not yet reached them, but I had already started to transform. A shiver rivered down my spine. I told myself it was the drugs tightening my muscles. When I looked up, I saw a hole gaping in the sky like a giant throat. I dismissed it as a hallucination. Then my tongue split into a fork. Talons sprouted from my fingertips. I went cold everywhere, my blood congealing into pure iron and salt. It all sounds scary, but I wasn't scared. Instead, I was filled with wild, gleeful rage. Lars kept laughing. I stood, and the clicking word in my throat. I flexed my digits, now enormous eagle talons, sheathed in wrinkled skin and topped with tough claws. I stalked across the circle. White light and smoke made shadows dance around me. No one said anything when I knelt and grabbed Lars's hand. No one stopped me, quick as a snake strike. My jaws clamped down on his fingers. I'm yelling, stay with me, stay with me, as I plunge down the hill, arms pinwheeling. I know who I'm talking to now. I glimpse Claire Dawn's shocked face as I shoot by. I drop my gun in the grass. I bet I look crazy, but I pretty much feel okay. My shouts catch the attention of the Acer True Horde. They stop their terrorizing to stare. I am encircled by hammer forms, a Rottweiler snout, a wolf's white teeth, an anteater tongue. They look like they're wearing masks, but they're not. I yodel and scream to ensure their full attention, even as my heart shrivels in fear. Come on, I say, here I am. I'm the freak. Catch me. I dare you. Catch me. They are beyond recognizing friend or foe. 
They are simply filled with bloodlust as I was. I force myself to stand my ground a little longer until Cody Eisenhower, half bear, half man, lumbers forward. He is soon joined by a crocodile and a lion. My brother lopes up, unrecognizable now, his arms covered with coarse fur. Before they lunge, I turn, running from the farm, leading them off. They are immediately hot on my heels, howling with delight. I wonder which one of them will catch me first, how long it will take for them to tear me to pieces. Above the tree line up ahead, the throat in the sky is wide open. I didn't kill Lars Strickland, although I might have. In the end, I focused only on his fingers. Blood fountained all over. I rolled and danced in it. My wrath was like fireworks exploding gloriously. But I awoke the next morning, naked and alone, with the taste of iron in my mouth. Flecks of bone still grated on my tongue. Dirt and blood coated my body in a Jackson Pollock collage of gore. Only then did I think of the tears on Lars's face, as I snapped his fingers and tore them away, how he begged me to release him, how he had screamed when I forced his jaws open and then made him bite down, how someone had to pull me off. How even then I shrieked, snapped, and shouted, my whole body convulsed with lust and rage. Someone else took poor Lars to the emergency room. I heard he told the doctors he'd caught his hand in a saw. Days later, I visited him in his mother's kitchen. His round face was slack from painkillers. My whole body felt rigid with shame. I'm sorry, I told him. His hand looked like a giant white mitten swathed in bandages. He held it aloft. Now I'm like you, man. It was the drugs, Lars. Oh, nah. He waved his wounded arm in dismissal. I shouldn't have laughed. He looked at me. You're one badass mother, ain't you, tiger? Gonna do us proud in the race wars. But I don't want to do that again, Lars. To anyone. Dude, he said. You gotta. Or what did you make me eat my fingers for, huh? He held his bandaged hand to his mouth. Make them eat it, dude. Make them eat it all up. Sometimes I think I will never get the taste of raw flesh out of my mouth. Now the animals are gaining on me. I feel hot breath on my back, hear pants and whimpers getting closer. I remember almost falling off a seams tree. I see meteor showers streaking above fallow fields. I hear Mrs. Saeed calling me a good boy and feel her warm hand on my shoulder. My foot snags on a tuft of grass. I topple and the ground drives out what's left of my breath. Teeth, claws, fur gallop all around me. I try to crawl away, but someone sinks their claws in my back. A set of jaws clamps on my scalp. They yank up my head. The world tilts and wheels. Will they snap my neck first? My back? It doesn't matter. My spine is still human. My mind is still human. Even my claws, clenching the earth, are still human. I'm still here. Even as they start tearing me to pieces. Wow. When I first read this story, I had a huge problem with it, because I didn't want it to be the only story. That said, it rang true on so many levels. I couldn't put it down, and some of those truths are uncomfortable. I have all of Claire's books, and some of Asim's, and I see people on Facebook and Twitter drawing righteous lines in the sand every day, because it's easier to blame someone else than to look in the mirror. But spiritual paths are all about the mirror. You decide who you are. There's never just one story. It's never just us versus them. I grew up a nature-loving pagan. My whole family are nature-loving pagans. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Happy Dag is real. Well, not the werewolf part, but Stephen McNallan and the Ossetru Folk Assembly are real, and their folkish practice of ancestor worship refers to a very specific set of folk. One of the most devoted and knowledgeable women I've ever met was invited to these folkish circles, but only if she hid her Mexican surname. I hate that my community yields people like Happy Dag. I hate the Sylvies that make you feel like you belong, but only if you tear someone else down. Every group has them. But every group also has a seams, who stand their ground because they know they'll lose more if they run, not just for their sake, but for their families 
for their name, and for their future. That woman I mentioned? She introduced me to the ways in which pagans who follow Norse gods self-police. They make sure their communities are safe for everyone and fearlessly confront racism before it has a chance to take hold. To her, and those like her, ancestor worship means respecting all those who came before, not just where they came from. They use their history, good and bad, to hold themselves to a higher standard. Those people remind me of Tiger, the raptor boy, who realized when he was wrong and chose to fix it. To try, even if he lost, because he would have lost more if he ran. For pagans, Muslims, and everyone else, our shared history is like a giant tree. The roots are made of hazy translations of fragmented myths, which grow and solidify into a trunk made of historical context. That trunk supports millions of diverse branches that stretch toward the mind-boggling mathematics of galaxies in motion. There's room enough for all of us, somewhere in there. No matter how many times human beings draw righteous lines in the sand, nature blurs them together with wind, rain, and time. Happy Dag had it right about one thing. There's magic in inspiring others to action, but those actions are up to us, and they might be the most important choices we make. If someone else decides who you are, look in the mirror, Ask if it's true, then decide for yourself. Cast of Wonders relies on your donations to pay our authors and bring you the best in young adult audio fiction week after week. If you've enjoyed this story, please consider making a donation using the PayPal buttons on our site. Every one time or, better yet, recurring monthly subscription helps, and you have our heartfelt thanks. You can share your appreciation for this story by leaving us a review on iTunes, sharing the episode with your friends and family, or discussing it on the EA Forum, forum forum.escapeartists.net. We're at Cast of Wonders on Twitter. Come say hello. Cast of Wonders is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is brought to you by the creative team of our fearless leader, Marguerite Kenner, assistant editors Danny Daly and Catherine Inskip, and our entire Slush team, as well as the audio producers Jeremy Carter and Ricky Lacoste. I'm Setsu Uzume, and it's been my pleasure to host this episode. Our episodes are released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. You can share the episode, but you can't change it or sell it. Our theme, Appeal to Heavens, is by Alex Nove from MusicAlley.com. Thanks for listening.